Scooby-Doo Night of 100 Frights wasn't the first Scooby-Doo video game, but it was the first one that really tried to capture the feeling like you were playing an episode of an old Scooby-Doo cartoon. It recreated iconic scenes from the show, used the same voice actors from previous Scoob cartoons. We're here to solve a mystery. <laughs> but apparently the thing they thought was most important was to prominently feature a baffling element from the original cartoon. Don't tell me, because it's haunted, right? Yes, yeah, Shaggy. How'd you know? Because it's always haunted! <laughs> the fake studio audience laugh track. It wasn't a good idea. Uh, it was a bad idea, actually. <laughs> According to a poll I put up on my Twitter, about one in four of you weren't aware that the original Scooby-Doo Where Are You cartoon used canned audience laughter to punctuate certain jokes so you know that they're funny. And it's just, it's so helpful because I wouldn't have known to laugh without being told that I should. Other times they would add in like this nervous snickering anytime there was even a little bit of silence. The Black Knight is supposed to come alive when the moon is full. Like, wow, the moon was full last night. Shaggy's looking at us. What do we do? We're, we're, we laugh, right? We ha 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 ha. And I don't even understand what's happening here. S Scooby's just walking, you know? That's not even like a silly cartoon dog thing. It's just a dog. Th he's, he's a dog. He's walking. It's so normal for dogs to walk that they named a yo-yo trick after it. And it's the only one people know. Now, people look back on this laugh track today with uh, disdain for how annoying and repetitive it is. But at the time, it was an element that helped make the show successful. So much so that this laughter continued through the new Scooby-Doo movies. Like you wouldn't happen to have a bat cookie on you, would you? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. The Scooby-Doo show. This is my half, Scooby, like you eat from the other end. <laughs> Ending with the first season of Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, while the second season picks up without a laugh track, weirdly. Uh, presumably because Scrappy sucks all the joy out of the room. I'm kidding, I like Scrappy. You're all just mean. Even today, there are still homages to Scooby-Doo's laugh track as this profound, quintessential element of the series. Mystery Incorporated, a series that to me feels like a love letter to the entire Scooby-Doo franchise, literally ends, spoilers by the way, with the mystery machine driving off into the sunset as we fade to black over What's that sound? Scooby Dooby Doo! A laugh track, something this particular show had never used before until these very final moments, intentionally calling back to the original Scooby Doo cartoons. But why? It's not like Scooby-Doo was the first cartoon ever to use a laugh track. Dozens of Hanna-Barbera cartoons used a laugh track from 1960 to 1980. But for some reason, Scooby-Doo is the cartoon, I feel, that gets most associated with phony laughter. Laughter that only got progressively worse as time went on due to budget cuts that we will talk about. It is unforgivably bad. But as annoying as those old looping laugh tracks might be today, Hanna-Barbera saw them as the thing that helped make Scooby-Doo successful. And even more so, helped save their entire studio. <laughs> Sponsored by NordVPN. More about that later. How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and the thing about early Hanna-Barbera cartoons is that they wanted to capture the feel of the sitcom that dominated television in America during the 1950s and 60s, but they wanted to do it with cartoons, which meant that they could add more robots and bears with hats and dogs with hats and a gorilla but he's got a hat on. Flintstones was prehistoric honeymooners, Top Cat was the Phil Silver show for furries, and of course, Scooby-Doo was based heavily on the many loves of Dobie Gillis. I've already done a video that goes into much more detail about that if you wanna watch it after this one, I'll have it linked below, but you sort of see what they were going for, right? If Hanna-Barbera was trying to translate live action sitcoms into animation, the inspiration didn't just stop at characters and general setups. The language of sitcoms on TV at the time necessitated a laugh track, which meant 
so did Scooby-Doo. The same is not true for the language of video games, which are typically a lot longer than the half-hour television sitcom. Night of a Hundred Frights is a seven-hour game, ten if you're a completionist. And the laugh track wouldn't just play during cutscenes. The audience would laugh at you during the gameplay itself. <laughs> They'd laugh at Scooby when he did silly things, which means they're really laughing at you, the player. They're laughing at you, you fool! Although presumably all of the people who provided the laughs are dead, which means this game is haunted, woo! And that's how Mystery Inc. stays in business. And the people making Scooby-Doo video games kept doing it for three other games after this one, until they graciously decided to give the players a way to turn off the laugh track, finally. And I've not been able to confirm this, but I've heard they did a similar thing for the old Scooby-Doo cartoons as well, at one point selling home copies of them that didn't include the laugh track because viewers outspokenly found it obnoxious. But here's the thing, there are actually two versions of the Scooby-Doo laugh track. One of them is fine, it's decent, but it only lasted for a single year. The other one is truly terrible, lasted for a decade, and is probably the one you know best and hate best. So I've been referring to this laugh track as canned laughter, which is a term for laughter that's added in later in post-production. Having a live studio audience at the taping of the TV show was a legitimate thing, still is a legitimate thing, but it creates limitations. I mean, for starters, nearly every scene in a sitcom would have to be set indoors because moving the entire audience to an outside set or even to a massive soundstage that wasn't equipped with bleachers, it just wasn't feasible. Plus, you know, if an actor flubbed their punchline, the audience would naturally laugh less and less hearing the same joke over multiple takes, a thing my five-year-old nephew has yet to comprehend. No, please, I would love to hear how you make a tissue dance for the twelfth time today. The solution to both of these problems was pre-recorded laughter that you could insert into the show later. The first use of canned laughter on television was in this super obscure sitcom called The Hank McCune Show that only lasted for, I, I believe, five total episodes. People are not fond of the show. The immortal Hank McCune. Some of the most god-awful garbage that ever graced the idiot box. Yes, I'm talking industrial strength, utter trash. Canned laughter also opened up this idea of using a laugh track for cartoons, since obviously they couldn't real-time animate episodes of Scooby-Doo in front of a live studio audience to get candid reactions. That's impossible, even for Quick Draw McGraw. And drawing quickly is this whole thing. Uh, and the answer, by the way, is you put a little boogie in it, that's how you make a tissue dance. Now, the single human being who invented the laugh track was a sound engineer by Charlie Douglas in the 1950s. He was working on single cam sitcoms at the time, which meant that actors had to often do uh, scenes multiple times from different angles, which made the laughter from the live studio audience super inconsistent. Plus, for a medium where a director might want to have complete control over everything from lighting and blocking and, of course, sound design, a live audience was a chaotic, unpredictable element thrown into that mix. Not too different from trying to film outside in the middle of a busy city. Charlie Douglas, being a sound engineer, noticed that the audience might miss a joke and not laugh, or maybe they would laugh, but someone in the audience is one of those untamably distracting guffaws. You know, something like, you know, one of those. So he would start sweetening the audio by adding in more laughter or muting especially intrusive audience members to make everything sort of fit the vision of the producers. But even at the start, Douglas knew that you couldn't just record a couple takes of an audience laughing and use that over and over and over again without people at home getting annoyed. A thing we've mysteriously forgotten about. The human brain is hardwired to detect patterns. I mean, that's pretty much all our brains are good at to the point of often seeing patterns where there aren't any, like superstitions, or this image of dots that people keep telling me has the number five in it. So Douglas built a specialty machine called the Laugh Box, which was basically this keyboard with hundreds of pre-recorded audience reactions on it that he could mix and match together at various volumes and lengths and in thousands of different combinations to simulate the appropriate audience response. Uh, he also recorded new reactions every couple of months and retired old ones that became too recognizable just to try and keep everything fresh. The Laugh Box was so effective and so cheap to implement that many shows stopped using a live studio audience altogether and switched to solely using the box. 
Flex. And since he single-handedly invented this device, Douglas was effectively the only person in the entire industry who could add in or sweeten an audience laugh track on TV shows, which meant if there was a laugh, on television any time between the 50s to the 70s, it was likely from this guy with his weird little box being shuttled around from studio to studio, pushing buttons in a dark room somewhere. This includes Hanna-Barbera cartoons, but it also included others. I believe Rocky and Bullwinkle was the first cartoon to use Douglas's laugh track in 1959. Burris raced to beat the heavy safe to the ground, and he won. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> With the Flintstones following shortly after in 1960. Watch this. Flop! One more four out of you and I'll give you what for? <laughs> but why Scooby-Doo is so important is because up until that point, the laugh track was used almost exclusively on prime time cartoons. Other cartoons that were shown during the daytime didn't have canned laughter until... The Banana Splits Adventure Hour in 1967. But that was more of a variety show with live action and cartoon segments, and not every segment had a laugh track. They were still very much experimenting with it. Plus, technically, that was a midday time slot, so if we want to just look at the famed Saturday morning cartoon block, then Scooby-Doo was Hanna-Barbera's first to use Douglas's laugh box. And it was specifically Scooby-Doo's success, not the Flintstones, not the Jetsons, not the Banana Split Adventure Hour, which by the way should be called the Banana Split Adventure Hour. It was Scooby-Doo specifically that inspired Hanna-Barbera to expand the laugh track into nearly all of their cartoons throughout the rest of the 70s. Huge caveat, though. Remember how I said that studios used Douglas's laugh box to outright replace audiences in part because it was cheap? Well, even that was too expensive for Hanna-Barbera. It makes sense, though, really. I mean, Charlie Douglas had a monopoly on laugh tracks. He could charge anything he wanted. What are you gonna do about it? Download some low-quality laughter from YouTube? You can't. It hasn't been invented yet. It was a better time. They did sort of do something similar, though. Hanna-Barbera had their own sound engineers isolate some audience laughter from previous episodes of their cartoons to create new mixes of their own. In other words, they literally took Douglas's own laugh tracks and started remixing them for themselves. But you will notice an unmistakable sharp drop in what their sound engineers could do compared to what Douglas could do. Now, partially that's due to Douglas having a decade of experience, more than I think a decade of experience at this point with a custom machine that he designed for this particular purpose, but it's also because his laugh box had 320 distinct laughs on it that he could mix together in countless ways, while the sound engineers at Hanna-Barbera had less than 10. Some reports I found said that Hanna-Barbera had a total of six laughs, six total laughs for every episode of all of their cartoons for a decade. Though to be fair, they did try different creative techniques like speeding it up or slowing it down just to try and make their limited budget of laughs sound a little bit different. It's most noticeable in the new Scooby-Doo movies. Nobody in his right mind would use this as a secret hideout. I would. Like I said, nobody in his right mind. Come on, let's go. <laughs> And it's just like we talked about earlier. If you repeat the same audio over and over again after every punchline on every cartoon, it won't take long for the viewers and critics to pick up on it and get annoyed. And that's exactly what happened. So you might be wondering then, why not just cut the laugh track out completely, right? If Hanna-Barbera was trying to save money and people at home were hating their now inferior canned laughter, why not just scrap it. Well, it sort of goes back to what I was saying at the top. Hanna-Barbera wanted to mimic the appeal of multicam sitcoms and the laugh track was a part of it. Plus, and this is just me speculating, but it might have actually been cheaper for them to keep using the laugh track than to stop using it, right? Because then after any joke they wanted, they could freeze frame for a couple moments after the punchline and just fill it with fake laughs and save themselves from having to animate anything during that window. With him around, I can't even get a bite in edgewise. <laughs> Any editor will tell you that it is significantly faster and cheaper to add in a bad sound effect than it is to animate literally anything. And Hanna-Barbera was already trying to animate as little as possible. You ever wonder why so many of their animal characters have collars but no rest of their shirt? It helped them section characters into distinct chunks so that they only had to animate like a character's head and not have to animate their whole body. Sometimes you can even see how they like 
split up Scooby-Doo's head so they could animate just his mouth without having to animate the rest of his face. My point is any and all cost cutting measures were always on HB's table. Now, don't get me wrong. I am glad that we have gone away from using a laugh track in cartoons. I don't even like them that much on live action sitcoms. But I do think the laughter in the original Scooby-Doo cartoon, the one done by Douglas, I think that one's fine. I think it's good, actually. And it adds to the charm of the show. After that, though, yeah, it's, it's real rough. And I don't know, it, to me, it's just sad that Hanna-Barbera saw the success of Scooby-Doo and figured that it must be, in part at least, because of the laugh track. So much so that they then copied it across all of their cartoons so poorly that now, ironically, people look back on early Scooby-Doo cartoons with disdain and annoyance specifically because of the laugh track. Scooby-Doo! <laughs> and just speaking personally, I think if you really want to laugh, then please watch this ad. I worked really hard on it. Hi, I'm Melvin Dew, star of the hit 2002 film Scooby-Doo the Movie. Uh, Melvin Dew? Yep, that's me there. I look exactly the same as I do right now. Fun film fact, did you know that Spooky Island was actually filmed at an Australian resort called the Tangaluma? Less fun film fact, did you know that if you're in Australia, you can't actually watch Scooby-Doo the Movie on Netflix because it's not available in that region. You'd have a better chance of actually staying the night at the Tangaluma, and their website says they're fully booked through the 25th century. But thanks to today's sponsor, NordVPN, I can actually trick my internet into thinking that I'm in Italy, where the Scoob content is dished out like never-ending slices of delicious pizza pie. Now that is a spicy meatball. And that's because using a virtual private network like NordVPN allows you to spoof your location to access content on the internet outside of the country you're actually in. Now, obviously, the main point of using a VPN is to keep you and your data safe while you're surfing the internet from hackers and nosy internet service providers. But the truth is, the scope of protection and security that you get from a VPN alone is limited, which is why NordVPN is more than just a VPN. They recently introduced threat protection, which protects your device from malicious websites, malware, trackers, and intrusive ads, even if you're not connected to a VPN server. It just cleans up the internet for you automatically, making your browsing safer and more private. And that's in addition to also being a VPN, if you want that functionality as well. And as we've established, I'm Melvin Dew. I've seen meddling kids track down clues about people's private lives and whereabouts. It's fun when they do it, they get to wear cool outfits. But it's not fun when big tech companies online are tracking my every move. There's no catchy musical chase scene involved. And if your reaction is similar to mine, celebrity heartthrob Melvin did, then go to nordvpn.com slash nerdsyncvpn to get a two-year plan plus four additional months for free with a huge discount. We're talking like 64% off. Once again, that's nordvpn.com slash nerdsyncvpn. Link will be in the description. Clicking that link will not only help me and my channel, but you know, it'll also make your internet browsing a little bit more private, a little safer. What's not to love? Go check it out. Thank you so much for watching. It's Scoobtober. I'm rushing to make a bunch of Scooby-Doo videos at the tail end of October, uh, mostly to build up my Patreon and also annoy my fans who only want me to talk about comic books. And if that sounds good to you, then please, please, please support me on Patreon. Link's gonna be in the description. I would love to hit a thousand patrons this year with names like Amanda Trisdale, Brendan, Christopher Lang, DeCassowary, Emma DeNby, Eric Ketchum, Jacob Rundell, Jonathan Lenowski, Carl Bachman, Irenarson, so sorry about that. Uh, Rebecca Moss, William Talatson, A Filthy Casual, BKBW, Eric Totoro Pato, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Mar Soddle Dean, Pete Temple, and the rest of the wonderful nerds who support me over at patreon.com slash nerdsync. Link will be in the description. Genuinely, please check it out. I'm trying to buy a house. <laughs> I would love to buy a house and move out of my one bedroom apartment. Finally, please. Once again, my name is Scott, reminding you to explore your favorite art through curiosity and vulnerability. See ya.